can so, go ahead and get started. Um, yeah. My name is uh, Ali Rosa. For you, those of you who don't know me, I think everybody here knows me. Um, this is being recorded, so parents can view this later. Um, the FSHD Society had a Volunteer Le Leadership Summit in Chicago at the beginning of February, and they asked us to speak on what the early onset chapter initiatives have been over the last year. I spoke the previous year, and uh, we updated them on what we've been working on, which has been a lot, thank to, thanks uh, in large part to solve F FSHD and Eva Chen, who has helped us um, further our initiatives quite a bit. So I'm just going to jump into the presentation. Um, I'm going to start it off. Kristen will probably jump in at some point, and Debbie as well. Let me share my screen here. I just need to run to the printer. I'll be right back. Okay. It always does this to me. I hope I don't cry again. <laughs> No, no he said, um, my name is Allie Rhodes, Kristen uh, Zwickow, and uh, Debbie Eggleston helps uh, me run the early onset chapter for the FSHD Society. We have been doing this for about almost three years now. Our mission uh, for the early onset chapter is to educate, support, advocate, and bring trials and treatments to those living with FSHD regardless of age of onset, severity, or ambulation. Um, we're here to bring the community together and advocate for all those populations affected by FSHD. So about a year ago, um, like I, I, I said, stated earlier, I gave a presentation at the Volunteer Leadership Summit in Chicago. And <laughs> at the end of my presentation, someone asked, why don't we have um, the children represented at the World Alliance, the FSHD World Alliance? And that kind of sparked something. It threw a pebble into the water and started a ripple effect. And so the pediatric breakout was added to the, um, the IRC portion of the World Alliance uh, conference. And in doing that, they asked me if I would int help introduce the pediatric portion. So I worked with Debbie and with Kristen and we put together this video that was shown right before the IRC. So I'm gonna show it now for those of you who have not seen it. Hello, my name is Allie Rhodes. Kristen Zwickow and I lead the early onset chapter. In the context of the chapter, we are here to support parents and children with early onset symptoms of FSHD and advocate for trials and treatments for kids. But in the broader scope of the FSHD community, everyone who has FSHD had it as a child. This is a disease that a person is born with. Symptoms just manifest at different ages for different people. Pediatric FSHD really is everyone with FSHD. My son, Sam, and Kristen's daughter, Kate, were both diagnosed at age six. And like most children that show symptoms at an early age, they have progressed quite rapidly, going from active toddlers to needing mobility assistive devices to losing their ability to walk before their teens. For those individuals with early onset symptoms, this is not a slow progressing disease like the medical journals will have you believe. Time is mobility. Time is life altering surgeries. Time is life-threatening symptoms like decreased lung capacity and weakened hearts. We envision a world where children do not have to experience one symptom of FSHD. With early testing, intervention, and treatment at first signs, or with testing at birth, even before symptoms start, our children do not have to carry the burden of FSHD throughout their lifetime. Every expert in this room knows early intervention is paramount to eradicating this disease. Right now, our most pressing need is to establish clinical trial endpoints for pediatrics and get them enrolled in clinical trials so they too can receive treatment when available. Our parent group is working with pharmaceuticals and regulatory agencies. We cannot establish endpoints and enroll pediatrics in clinical trials without an all-in mindset and determination from every stakeholder in this community. We need to work to consolidate the pediatric efforts worldwide into one concerted effort. 
pull the data to create a usable pediatric investigation plan now, within months, not years. The kids do not have time for work to be done in silos. Imagine celebrating a treatment victory without including the pediatric and non-ambulatory populations. How hollow a celebration that will be. How can we justify stepping over the children and those in wheelchairs to provide treatments to their parents and other adults and their families? We cannot stop our countdown to the first treatment for FSHD without including the most vulnerable populations in our community. We cannot let our children waste away for 18 years and have their bodies atrophy and contract before we consider them for treatment. I implore you, please don't leave this conference without a solid plan to include pediatrics and the non-ambulatory in clinical trials. Thank you for your work. Please find a way to include pediatrics and the non-ambulatory. I exist too. So with those words, I exist too, that Kate spoke, it sparked something in the community and suddenly we were getting a lot more calls from pharma. We got the attention of other folks that wanted to jump in and help us and our cause was launched um, even further down the road. The reason behind the clinical trial, one of the reasons behind the clinical trial landscape that we see now is the definition of FSHD that's published in most of the literature you see out there. It says FSHD is typically characterized by a slow uh, disease progression and that life expectancy is not shortened. This disease isn't a slow progressing benign disease for many people who have FSHD. In fact, a lot of the early onset population suffer very quickly. They lose their ambulation, usually 40% of them before um, they graduate high school. They are faced with lung issues, respiratory issues, heart issues. And just now the definition is starting to be changed, but we need to push that even further so that the pharmaceuticals and the people that are developing these trials know that there's no time to wait that a lot of these populations need to get in clinical trials now before they lose muscle that they may never get back. Ellie, I was just wondering if I could add one thing. Um, so during the conference in Chicago, I, uh, there are kind of like two themes and I just feel like it fits so much into what um, is happening with us. One is, um, one was like that there are like, you know, these tipping points. And I just feel like we had these two big ones. When you spoke a year ago in Chicago, um, and then, you know, just one person said, oh, how about, you know, how about a video, and, you know, like that idea. Um, and so the video at IR, or I'm sorry, the video in Milan was huge. And then also having the chance to, to work with Eva and having Saul work with us, that was a, like, we had these two huge, um, events, I think that really changed the course for us. Um, and also the other thing is just like small things can matter. And you just, you said it, you know, someone had this suggestion, this just this little thought, and that's what led to the video and going to Milan. So just, I just say that because, you know, at the end, I'm going to ask people to think about what they can do to contribute. And, and sometimes it is just little things um, that can help it and can really change the course of our progress. So so yes, thanks for uh, thanks for adding that, Debbie. A small spark can certainly ignite, um, you know, a, a huge blaze, and uh, hopefully, um, we can gather the the entire parent population and the community together to advocate for all the FSHC population. I think none of us have to look too far to see that we've known 30s, 40 years old, and sometimes younger that have died from respiratory issues and other issues related to FSHD. So we just need to make sure that the sense of urgency is there um, regarding this disease and that, you know, we don't have all the time in the world. We need to do it now. So the other thing that we learned in talking with parents is that there is a sense of um, complacency. There can't be a, a sense of complacency because we think once there is a treatment, 
once fulcrum or avidity or someone gets over the line, that that treatment will be available to everyone. And that just hasn't been the case with other muscular dystrophies and most likely will not be the case for FSHD. Um, the folks that are left out of the clinical trials where um, the treatment hasn't been proven, the, the efficacy of the treatment hasn't been proven, they may be left out either because it's not labeled for them or because if, even if it is labeled for them, insurance may hesitate to pay for it because again, FSC hasn't been proven. Um, I'm gonna let uh, Dr. Eva Chen from Solve FSHD, she says it much better than I do. Uh, she was a guest on our show or on our meeting uh, a few months ago and she explained it to us very well. So I'm gonna play this short video from her as she explains how the reimbursement works. But if we just look at, you know, how things are done in the U.S., you know, to me, very simply, it's a two-step process. The pharmaceutical companies run the clinical trials and they generate data, and FDA will make a decision. Is the benefit uh, greater than the risk of taking the drug? So the FDA looks out for safety. Um, so if the drug is relatively safe, doesn't cause undue harm, and shows a benefit, they will approve it. The second step is who pays for it. So there's a payer involved in the US um, and uh, your children are not over 65. So Medicare, Medicaid, they ain't always irrelevant. It really is private health insurance that covers it. And the insurers will look at the data differently and they'll say, does the data support there's a benefit in the particular patient population? And again, the classic case now is with spinal muscular atrophy or SMA. Mucinersin was the first drug approved. It is an antisense oligo, relatively expensive. It has to be delivered intrathecally, meaning injected into the spinal column. Um, and the FDA approved it for all age groups, from infants down to adults. And, and SMA actually has four categories, SMA 1, 2, 3, 4, basically younger to older. The problem was that the data only existed in younger children with SMA. And so even though FDA approved it for everybody, health insurance said we're only going to pay for children because we only have data to show it works in children. Oops. But if we just look at you know how things are done in the US. Oh, you know, I'm sorry. Can be very simple. That, did it go all the way through? Doesn't cause undue harm and shows a benefit, they will approve it. The second step is who pays for it. So there's a payer involved in the US um, and uh, your children are not over 65. So Medicare, Medicaid, they ain't always irrelevant. It really is private health insurance that covers it. And the insurers will look at the data differently and they'll say, does the data support there's a benefit in the particular patient population? And again, the classic case now is with spinal muscular atrophy or SMA. Mucinersin was the first drug approved. It is an antisense oligo, relatively expensive. It has to be delivered intrathecally, meaning injected into the spinal column. Um, and the FDA approved it for all age groups, from infants down to adults. And, and SMA actually has four categories, SMA 1, 2, 3, 4, basically younger to older. The problem was that the data only existed in younger children with SMA. And so even though FDA approved it for everybody, health insurance said we're only going to pay for children because we only have data to show it works in children. So as uh, Dr. Eva Chan stated so clearly that even if a uh, pharma gets the FDA to approve the drug for everybody, the second step is getting insurers to pay for it for everybody. So that's what we've been fighting on. That's a, it's kind of a two-pronged attack. First, we have to get the kids and the non-ambulatory into clinical trials. Then we have to get the insurance to pay. Then we have to get FDA to approve it for all populations. And then we have to get the insurance to come back and reimburse it for all populations. Because these treatments are very expensive. They're very, very expensive. I think, uh, Kristen, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Fulcrum's about $400,000 a year. 
Um, um, it's not validated as speculation. So it's kind of, you know, nothing that people have validated as real, but those are the numbers. I mean, if you look at the most recent Duchenne's drugs that have been approved, the shots are $3.2 million. Um, so, you know, when it comes to rare disease, the, the price tag is a lot more than your average Advil. <laughs> Um, right. So yeah. think in those terms, they have to think in terms. I think that at the at the uh, leadership conference, I think people were surprised. I think again, it's the thought process is well, once it's approved, it's approved for all. And and I think that the thing that we in the FSHD community need to start to realize is that it's not a one size fits all, and that the approval process is not being built as a one size fits all. And so that's why we need to be very thoughtful and make sure that we are educated on what that means for everybody in the community. So right. just to clarify, right. you know, so your small molecules, the pills that you swallow, generally the high end is 350000 a year. I've just seen those commercial projections. Uh, it's the gene therapies that are supposedly a one and done IV infusion. Those are the ones that are currently charging two, two and a half, three million dollars. And then the antisense oligo that I mentioned before, nusinersen is somewhere in between. You do have to have multiple rounds of infusions. Um, unfortunately, it, it, it is part of a bigger um, business ecosystem where in order for companies to get investor dollars to develop these drugs, you have to at least project a high revenue. So, you know, somebody eventually has to pay for it if investors are going to put in money. But 350000 on the low end to $2.5 million on the high end, depending if it's something you take every day or it's a one-and-done gene therapy. But either way, nobody can just pay for that annually. So, I mean, that's the point is that we... Well, some we people can. To... Most people okay. can. <laughs> yes. Most, okay. yeah. most people cannot pay for... Yeah, it's paying yeah. for that. So, right. um, so it's, it's important that yeah. we do this advocacy work. Um, Absolutely. Yes, yeah, very few of us have, you know, four thousand dollars in. I wish I had that sitting around. <laughs> A lot of other problems would go away. Right. <laughs> so I'm going to let Debbie take the call to action slide that they talked about um, in Chicago. Yeah, so I just, I guess one thing I wanted to mention too is um, we didn't want to rehash everything we've said be before, but I did want to remind people that um, there are, like, these are recorded. And so I will tell you that when Maggie was diagnosed a year ago, I went back and listened and learned from these two women. Um, and so I can tell you that if you want to learn more about the summit and some things that Eva said, those are in um, what, October, November. So we won't go through all of that again. Um, but we just wanted to mention that we were just trying to let everyone know how important all this work is and that really we need we need help from other families, um, parents and kids. So um, some of the important work we're doing is engaging with pharmaceutical companies. Um, they they really need to know about kids. I mean, we have learned that they um, they don't know every single thing about FSHD and certainly not for kids and they have specifically, some companies have asked us, could they meet kids? They like to have a relationship with people. So um, so we need families who are willing to visit companies. Um, we want our message heard. We want them to know about our kids. And, um, and there are other advocacy things we need like sending letters to um, senators and FDA. And we want to meet with FDA because they need to learn about FSHD and kids. Um, and so, um, but I think also Debbie, one last point yeah. here on this one, sorry uh -huh. to, to inject, yeah, so but, go ahead. um, it's also educating yourselves. It's also learning about what's going on in the pipeline and the different drugs that are being developed or the different therapies that are being developed so that you as a consumer understand what options could be potentially out there and do those meet what you would be looking for, for your family, um, mm -hmm. your and or your child. So um, education also goes a long way. Some of the things that we've been hearing is that, um, you know, pharmaceuticals are also like, well, will the parents want their kids involved in these types of things? Another barrier to them thinking about putting kids into clinical trials is if we build it, will they come? 
And the only way the answer to that is, is an individual choice of what people want to and don't want to do. And that comes down to educating yourself about the tolerances of different avenues that you could take for your family and where you're at in your own journey. So I think educating and leaning in and understanding what are the drug companies doing and what and how does that um, you know affect and what is their approach to the disease um, is is a huge um, a huge piece of it to know whether you're going to lean in or not and where you want to lean in. So and really yeah. having that re- making sure you have that relationship with your doctor too so that you can learn about that because i i know that sometimes in the groups we hear about oh we go back and they tell the same thing i'm weaker but it we really have to you know have these relationships with the neurologist and the fshd specialist so we can get connected to the opportunities and also learn um, that being said as for each caleb person. actually yes. goes that being said caleb actually goes to his neuro clinic his six month one not tomorrow on Thursday. So if there, like, is there something when I go there that I like, is there something I should be saying, doing, you know, to Dr. DeRoos, his neurologist, like to get in that, that relationship and knowing, you know what I mean? I can tell you that I've had, we've had at least like two calls where we've gone through and asked her about the different types of treatments and you know what she's thinking about them and what you know she thinks would be good for Maggie and um and just kind of talking about what um what we might be looking for I probably Kirsten and Allie have some more suggestions but I I just and I honestly I want a doctor who is informed and is not just measuring her every year and then you know suggesting AFOs but really knows what's happening um, you know, what researchers and pharmaceutical companies are doing so that, because I, I don't want to make these decisions on my own. I need a doctor who really, right. and, and I want someone who knows about the research and knows, knows what's going on. So, yeah, yeah. unfortunately, so, a, a lot of the, uh, the neurologists that aren't in one of the CTRNs, they, they don't know, they don't know a lot about the FSHD, um, progression and a lot of them don't know about the therapies in the pipeline. That's why it's important um, if you can get to get involved in like the move study or get your child seen by someone that that uh, practices at a CTR and they're more informed about you know the landscape of the F- in the FSHD trial world and they could probably give you more information on that. Um, we just put together a um, like a, a fact sheet about all the clinical trials that are going on and we can maybe push those out to the, to the parents. Um, I would like to get more in depth on, on exactly what happens when they go, like when they take an intravenous, intravenous um, treatment, how long is that? Is, are they there for two hours, six hours? I've heard different things, but we do have a cheat sheet we can push out to the parents, but um, yeah, talk to your doctor, but if you can get involved with, with one of the FSHD experts at one of the CTRNs, I would recommend that if you have one close to okay. you. Okay. And just, I guess just one thing to mention is when, when people go for the MOVE study, you can decide whether you want a clinical appointment or not. So you would actually see one of the neurologists. Okay. Yeah, you do both. You go the MOVE and then you also have a clinical, a clinical site um, Mm -hmm. visit with a neurologist there. But the, the question is just really question the doctor on what knowledge they have of the disease and also what's going on in the, in the, um, in the therapy development process. Okay. Um, I know he's, he seems pretty versed in FSHD. It's not like just in the disease and the progression. I, my question now will be, what does he know about what's in the pipelines? What's yep. going on there? So yep. we'll, both, we'll talk to him yep. about that. Yeah. So we had to take a two prong approach because Kate's um, primary doctors were, were that are close to us didn't really have as much knowledge. So we go to her local, we go to our local hospital here and get her baseline testing every year and visit okay. with them. But then I take her up to Rochester twice a year so that she can be seen by the specialists up there where we can get a more deep in depth. But I'm always ready with questions. Um, I go to the mm-hmm. FSHD Society website and I just study all the different pharmaceuticals that are in there, talking with Eva, talking with Allie, um, just having all of the information because what I've learned is we have to bring it to the doctors is it can't mm-hmm. be just waiting for them. Right. Okay. Okay. So um, one of the other things that we've been working on is a retrospective natural history study. 
And that was, um, that came from the meeting in California that um, companies were telling us they need to know the natural history of kids. So, um, so our thought is, okay, well, let's get this done. And so Eva has um, been very supportive with that. And that's just one of the things, um, a, a very concrete thing that we'll be looking for parents to help with um, and to have medical information for kids because we need to see how they progress and we can give that information to companies. Can I just uh, add one thing? Yeah. So yeah please. One of the important things about the retrospective study is it shortens the time period of when we can get this data. Uh, every pharmaceutical that we've talked to said they need more data on, on the younger kids, on the early onset kids. So instead of them having to be in a natural history study for two or three years, this is shortens and compresses the timeline. So it's really important that we can get this, get all these records kind of mined out, get a paper published and get it out to them sooner rather than later and have to wait for years for this data to be collected. And that's, I think that's in conjunction with the other thing. It was, you know, they told us we need outcome measures and we need the natural history. And so our thought was, okay, well, we're going to work on both um, and, and try to have this move along. So um, we don't, I don't have that on here, but that will be, you know, something else that that you might hear from us about that we want information there. So if we look at the third one where it says be part of the solution, when you hear from us, <laughs> it, you know, we, we need information from um, patients or from parents and kids um, so that we can get this work done. Um, let's see. And then the last thing, I think probably anyone who's on the parents group can't have missed the next that I have provided for the Connect conference. Um, I, it's, I, I'm, I just, I feel like it is an opportunity for us all to get together and hopefully accomplish a few things. Um, I hope that they have fun. And I will tell you, you know, Eva has had experience with other groups and, you know, she'll tell us sometimes that, you know, what the kids have done with the, um, with reps from the pharmaceutical companies and how they've, you know, have fun together. So this, you know, we're just getting started with kids for FSHD, but we hope that they have fun. And, um, and we want to, at the same time, do some of the important work that we're trying to do. So looking at outcome measures, if we have PTs in one area working together, and we have kids who are are um, wonderful subjects and, and we just have conversations and look at things and how they're moving and how they're functioning. It's, it's just so much more productive than trying to um, meet and talk to kids individually. Um, and then there's this great chance to advocate when, you know, we have uh, all these people are there for the um, more scientific meeting before Connect and then they're staying for Connect then we have a chance to talk to them. And another example for, or another chance to have pharmaceutical reps see our kids and see us and learn from us. Um, and I think, I don't know, at least one more thing that's important for my kid um, is, is just the, the peer support where, you know, like they go to school and they have, they have friends, but none of them experience what they're experiencing. So to just have a chance to hang, I mean, other than having fun to have a chance to hang out with kids who have some of the same experiences they do. So we're hoping to, to I will. Put it together and have it be a great experience. Yeah. What so you are, just are, said, um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, no, go ahead. The, um, what you just said resonates with me. Um, Caleb has always been very self-conscious of his shoulders, like nobody else looks like me, you know, things like that. We went to our walk this year and crew, um, Dre's son is, about he's between our kids his age uh, yeah. Maggie and Caleb so he's just I think 15 um and just even seeing him they didn't talk a lot they're both teenage boys you know how that goes mm -hmm. but um even just seeing him and knowing like wow he, he looks like me you know like we have that same shoulder slump that same you know protruding um winging you know all of that he it was I think he doesn't say much he's like I said a teenage boy mm -hmm. but, but just even just the little clues here and there and just like seeing him see him was so empowering for him. I know um, he's yeah. actually this Friday going to get a orange slice tattoo, which I never thought that he would. Oh, he's do doing that. It. Oh my goodness. Oh, okay. He's doing it for his 16th birthday. Yep. Here's a question. Uh, Cassie. Are you getting one also? I am. And so you is my are. daughter who doesn't, who isn't affected, but wanted to support both of us. So yeah. nice. I am. 
I said, we're going to have to explain it to everybody, but that's the point of it. So yeah, that they all yeah, get educated. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I will tell you that was like, I mean, I don't know, Ellie and Kristen are that for me, you know, like I, these moms who get it and, mm -hmm. um, and I, but I just think that Chicago is also helpful too, of, oh, you know, that you were all together and yeah. meeting all these wonderful people and it, it yeah, it, it just, I, I just feel I mean, like there's something to being together and, and being able to learn. As a parent people. and a patient for me people was understand. very, yeah, as a patient and a parent for me, Chicago mm -hmm. was awesome. I mean, you know, for myself, like it took 10 years to get the diagnosis, you know, to figure out what was going on with me. Like. I just knew something wasn't right. And then to see, you know, other parents that get it, like, you know, nobody around here, none of my kids, friends, parents get it. Like they don't, you know, they're like, Oh, you know, that's too bad when they hear about it and stuff, but they don't get it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But Yeah. Yeah. So that, I don't know, hopefully we can get some to come to connect. And I guess for parents who are watching later, um, you know, the hope is that, something strikes you and, and, you know, you can try to get involved with some of these, um, activities. We also, um, so the, the next slide, Ellie, we just, there are just some different skills we were trying to think, you know, so many things that we're trying to do with maybe people who want to help with, um, social media or, um, have, you know, can, uh, you know, I'll tell you, Kristen loves chat GBT, but if someone you know, <laughs> can, is really good at, um, at writing, you know, I, I want to keep bombarding my representatives <laughs> so that they know what FSHD is. Um, so can and, I say something real quick yes. before we're talking about the government advocacy? Yeah. So there are a couple other things that are in the pipeline. Um, we are working on a voice of the patient for pediatrics. Um, we hope to get that done, you know, this year, soon beginning of the year, first half of the year, hopefully, rather than the latter half of the year. And that's really important because the voice of the patient, what that does is basically you get to come on and tell your story of how FSHD affects your child or your child gets to tell their story of how living with FSHD affects them, their everyday life. And the FDA gets to hear that. They understand that there is a, a urgency and there's a need for a treatment for children. Um, and, and, and it educates them on what FSHD is so that then when a pharmaceutical does come to them to approve a drug, they already know, they already have an idea and they'll be educated on what FSHD is and how impacted, you know, these these kids are with it. So it's very important for them to sort of be socialized in the in the progression of FSHD. And also the FSHD Society is putting together in May, um, they're going to Capitol Hill to talk to some representatives about FSHD. And I believe they've invited, you know, swaths of all the, the populations, the adult and ambulatory, the non-ambulatory, the kids. And again, just to educate the governmental agencies on what FSHD is and its impact on, on the everyday life of the people who who have it and deal with it every day. Um, I think um, this education will go a long way to getting a, a drug approved more quickly um, when they come to it and it may be labeled more broadly. If they understand that there are children affected, that there are people in wheelchairs affected, when pharmaceuticals come and they ask for a broad label, like Eve was talking about earlier, they'll be more apt to approve it um, for, their, for, for a wider population. So if anyone has connections, either on this call or as people re-listen, we also are looking for, you know, it's always easier to get introductions into places like the FDA and different, um, and different people who can lead us in the right direction and even senators. Um, your local senator, um, getting any local public uh, uh, public office involved as well. Uh, there is no advocacy that's too small or, or too large. Um, we need it all. And sometimes it's the numerous voices that create the groundswell. Um, and it takes a long time and it can be uh, thankless, but um, eventually someone hears you and you can make movement. But without the government support, um, you know, it makes it harder for the companies to get across the finish line in knowing the full uh, effects. The other thing that we have to remember is that nobody knows the disease like we do. And to hear it from the people who are living with it every day is a lot more powerful than hearing it from a pharmaceutical or from 
um, from an advocacy group that doesn't have it living in their house day to day. Right. And we've we've talked about putting together a form letter um, and we're going to work on that that we're going to put on our website um, that you can just go in and kind of cut and paste and then and send it in to your representative to make it easier on everybody. So I think Debbie and I were also very encouraged by the number of people who um, at the conference, um, you know, really took in what we had to say about the non-ambulatory and pediatric population and um, and that we've been getting a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people leaning in and saying, you know, how can we help? We have someone who wants to do some marketing for us and we have someone who wants to do some video editing uh, in addition to, and then, uh, and then Debbie for helping with the connect conference had a couple of people lean in and say, we're event planners. So, um, <laughs> so it's, it's just whatever skills that you have to, to offer, you know, it's a, it's a lean in, but it needs to also be, we're a volunteer group. So it needs to be a lean in and then you need to be self-driven to execute as well. Um, you can't sit back and wait to be told what to do. You need to say, Hey, this is what I can do and just execute. Yes, yeah, so I'm curious if June has any other thoughts, because I, I, I have mentioned Connect a few times. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know if you have any input, but, um, and um, I know, like, I, I talked about, too, like, showing a video at IRC so that, you know, um, you know, they can see what it's like with kids. So we, you know, we might have some requests coming out for more requests for parents, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely we have a uh, sort of what we call keynote slots for both the IRC and um, actually for Connect we have that's a, it's a different format, but for certainly for IRC, uh, it's an opportunity to um, share the patient experience to a group of a room full of researchers, and um, you'd be surprised to know how many of these researchers have. Some have never met a patient. They're working on the cellular level. They're interested in the science, and they know that somewhere down the line there's a patient who could benefit from the work. But um, and they love the opportunity to learn more about the patients. Um, and then even some of the clinical researchers might see a few, you know. But to um, so so it's a prime opportunity. And the video, as you said, last year was very effective. And we talked about this year maybe also sharing a, vid a video. Um, that drills down on like the the day to day the impact on daily activities of daily living, and kind of do a, a whole bunch of them so that the cumulative effect of seeing you know like in one minute seeing like twenty different ways in which kids um, something they can't yeah. do because of FSHD I think will be very impactful. Um, by the way, the um, we did the pediatric uh, session last year at IRC for the first time. And now this year, without even questioning it, it's now like a regular part of the meeting. That's it awesome. wasn't a one-off. Nice. They're like, we've got to do this every year. So Debbie, there's your ticket tipping point. <laughs> <laughs> My what? Um, there's your tipping point. <laughs> oh yeah, I know. Yeah, this is. I mean, this really was it was great. And uh, for Connect, um, I was just going to say, um, like back in. 2010, there was a pediatrics focused, um, you know, it wasn't Connect called Connect then, but it was a patient meeting and they had it at the University of Iowa. And a lot of families came to that. And, um, and then since then, we haven't had it at an event that was specifically focused for kids or, and as you know, even as part of the regular track, like um, it hasn't been as integrated into it. So we really are um, wide open to thinking about how to do that. But one thing that was cool at 2010 is uh, kids who met each other um, became pen pals. So they did form like, you know, friendships, like a whole room full of people it might be overwhelming, but it's someone like, oh yeah, you know, that kid was cool. Um, I want to keep in touch with him. So um, I don't know what the 2024 equivalent of being a pen pal is. I think technology <laughs> has intervened and kind of <laughs> add you on my snap. That's what it would be. <laughs> and, but maybe there's like, yeah, exactly. It could be just exchanging, you know, you know. Yeah, I have your son to blame for my daughter being on Snapchat now. By the way. So. <laughs> but so you it, know, yeah. like June. Sorry, I was just gonna say, you know, like when you were talking about. Um, how sometimes those who are even in the clinic don't 
um, you know, they see some kids, but still don't, they don't have the experience that we do. I, um, so during these meetings I'm having with PTs about outcome measures, I, um, and ask parents, and of course, Allie and Kristen get all of this about like, you know, how does your kid do this? Or like, how is it with opening yogurt? And how, you know, yeah. so then Allie is amazing. It was like, oh, here, here's a video of Sam. So I'm like, <laughs> um, you know, immediately. And so I showed that to some of the PT. It, it's just like, it's amazing how much this really does help because mm -hmm. uh, they had responded and say, like, these are people who do see kids with FSHD. And it's, it's inter interesting to see, you know, three kids open it differently. Okay. Like that's what we want to measure um, when we're, you know, recommending things for clinical trials. So um, yeah, I just, I don't know. I just wanted to say that it, it really is helpful to have all of these bits of information from families and, and to show people, even those who have seen people with FSHD before. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, so I was thinking we, we're, we're tossing around a variety of ideas. I mean, at a, at a conference I connect where you have, I, I don't know how many kids will show up. It might be a half dozen. It might be seven dozens or more I, I you know but um uh you know what is it's it's a rare opportunity um what you know how can we make the most of it and we talked about having one of these remote assessment technologies there and to actually collect data on the kids and um obviously we you know we'd need to talk to the investigators who are developing this stuff and also whether just collecting a single time point is uh, useful to them, or maybe it's more, you know, I mean, they may have some, you know, get a lot of value out of it by just seeing a whole bunch of different types of kids and how they, how the measurements work with them and so on. But, but generally those are, you know, what they're looking at is longitudinal um, measurements, natural history. So just collecting from a group of kids at one time point, I, d I just, we would need to talk to them to figure out if that is, has value for them. Um, the other thing, this actually was done in, at the Iowa meeting is they collected um, biospecimens and they, you know, just in one day created a, a biobank of, you know, um, pediatric and early onset FSHD. So, um, so that was interesting, but I'm not sure that's, I mean, coming to conference and getting stuck with a needle may not be the, <laughs> The optimal experience for kids. So I don't know. So we need to have the owl, karaoke, <laughs> distract them, give them a we, lot we need of to make it gummy bears. really fun, June. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but I'd like um, to suggest only what you... the future means. <laughs> yeah. You know, having been to other pediatric events, I'd like to suggest a few things. Uh, number one, where you say some of these investigators haven't met people with FSHD especially anybody who's funded through FSHD Society, especially anybody that has a maybe a postdoc fellowship, they should do a family-friendly poster. So, uh, you know, some of the, these conferences will have a family-friendly poster session, and then you can now the element of fun, right? You can have snacks or something, but you should have the people that are funded through the society presenting it at the level to parents and, and the children. And the second I was going to say, Debbie, you mentioned already, you have to you have to create some elements of fun, right, for the children to create memories. And whether that is, I've seen at other places, they'll have a, a movie night and all the kids go to the movie. So that's at the end of the family friendly poster session. There's a movie and popcorn and children come in pajamas or there's some other event. I mean, I agree. I think it has to be fun for them and it creates this memory and they want to go next year. And, and then that's where you develop, I think, the relationships, not only among the children, but between the parents of the children. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the, you know, it'll start small, but it'll grow if you have some of these fun events. Um, another one that's done at one of them is, is they actually have some of the PIs race the, and these are children, this was, you know, pediatric neuromuscular disease. They will race the children in wheelchairs. Like the PI has to sit in a wheelchair and race against children who are non-ambulatory. So they, they make it fun. So you have to have the right people and engage them in the right way. So anyway, just throwing out some ideas for, you know, future um, events, future meetings. And to add to that, um, I know one thing like Caleb had asked is, well, are they all going to be kid events? Because like I'm 16, you know, like, right. so finding right. that balance of the age appropriate. For each age Absolutely. group. Yeah, because yeah. you got the little yeah. ones that you definitely want to be entertained. But then, yeah, like the teens too to bring maybe like yeah. a. 
fun little team club moment, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, even yeah, movie, we were knocking around several movie. ideas, like maybe a ma magician or movies, or maybe even have some gaming consoles set up in a room where they can play games or a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. I, I think mm -hmm. we're kind of kicking around. We're just trying to get the numbers on who's going to show up right now, I think, mm -hmm. June, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm really excited about this. This will be fun to have more families there. Yeah. It's great. Well, I think, I don't know, I can tell you that just with us, I think, you know, we have at least four coming, <laughs> like teens, you know? So, um, yeah, just get some, a couple of, some young ones too, and we'll have some events. That, yeah, but for sure, we have to think about their age and it's, we won't treat the teens like five-year-olds. Right. Well, okay, we have... I think we're about at time. Does anybody have any other comments, questions, suggestions? No, thank you all for, for coming. Um, thank you, Kristen, for tuning in from Canada on vacation. I appreciate it. <laughs> I crossed the border here? tomorrow. Oh, 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 oh I I'm did have a two-step process. Yeah. I'm still, in the, I'm still in the U.S., Allie. Oh, are you? Yeah. Tomorrow uh, I enter Canada. Okay. I did have one quick um, idea for um, awareness raising on Capitol Hill. So, uh, you know, definitely writing to legislators and so on is great. Um, uh, but if it, uh, so, you know, they usually will pay more attention if it's uh, like connected to some upcoming piece of legislation or things like that and, you know, policy issues. But one thing um, they have is uh, there's this thing called fly, you know, I forget the formal name of the pro program, but basically you ask your congressperson to um, fly a, an American flag over the Capitol building on a particular day for a particular reason. Mm -hmm. So um, one of our, our Connecticut chapter did that a couple of years ago, um, asked uh, Senator Murphy to fly flag, explaining that it's for World FSHD Day. So they flew the flag, um, and then she donated the flag to the New England Walk and Roll and auctioned it off. And a full disclosure, I bought it because <laughs> I thought it was so cool. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but they do like hundreds of flags a day. I mean, they just have like a, you know, it's a big, very popular thing, and. It's another way to, you know, like imagine if like they got a whole bunch of requests to fly on World FSHD Day, they go, they're going to be like, what is <laughs> World FSHD Day? And they'll, you know, they'll fly the flag for you. And it's, and you can make the request with like a, a picture, a story, or, you know, so that, you mm -hmm. know, they absorb what it is. Um, so that's, that's just a thought. And then you could turn it into fundraising <laughs> item afterwards. So June, this is just like an individual person can request it? Yep. Yeah. There's or a this... form. Okay. There's a uh, Google, mm -hmm. there's a page. I, I just Googled it and found it pretty quickly. And you can, um, it gives you instructions for how to do that. And it includes um, choosing a flag that you pay for yeah. um, that they will then um, run it up and it comes in a commemorative box afterwards. <laughs> You know, people in the Air Force do that a lot when they're retiring. They'll ask them to fly their flag and then they'll give it to them for their retirement ceremony. Yeah. But I never thought about doing it for that's a good idea. Yeah, so we need like a hundred of us to request it for the same day. Well, you know, you can't miss us. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those like everybody could do it easily, but you know, the cumulative effect of a lot of people doing it would be kind of cool. Um, you know, the other thing that um, Marie does here in Arizona is they put in this proclamation and they turn the water tower orange on World mm -hmm. FSHD and it's like, F, it's like FSHD day in Gilbert, Arizona, and they turn the water tower orange, which is pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, we've, and we've, all she had to do was kind of fill out a form, make a request for that as well. Yeah. Yeah. For a number of years, we were doing that with the Tobin Bridge, which is a landmark bridge in Boston. Um I think it, it kind of fell between the cracks last year, but it'd be great to do it again because they were very, they're very happy to do it. And then the idea is obviously you let everybody know and like, go take a picture of the orange bridge and put it on your social media and explain why you're doing it. So, okay, yeah. well, if, if that's it, I'm going to let everybody go. Um, 
Contact me at early onset chapter at fshdsociety.org if you want to contribute. Um, as you've heard this hour, we're working on a lot of different things and we need a lot of different talents. We need a lot of people to lean in and help us out. So please contact us and we will definitely put you to work. <laughs> so thank you so much for your time and um, have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.